vacation right now uh, and fighting a cold. But enough of the excuses. Let me uh, introduce myself, as Chris said, uh, Director of Operations at IES Engineering. I've been there approximately 10 years, have 15 plus years experience in electrical communications and control systems design. And Chris and Brian invited me to speak on behalf of IES today to go over our capabilities, uh, the services we offer, but then more importantly, uh, the learnings that we found on a recent uh, project that I managed <clears throat> that could benefit you all in cost savings or reductions in schedule. So what I'm going to do, because there is a lot of content, so I'm going to give you a very brief overview of IES, and I'll get through the first chunk of slides uh, to highlight our capabilities, and then if there's further questions, we could take those offline, and then we'll get to the heart of the presentation. So on our agenda, we have the introduction, capabilities, and then I'm going through uh, what IES defines as the project life cycle and how important collaboration is on a typical project, and then we will look at it uh, with respect to this produce water upgrade project. <clears throat> IES Engineering, uh, who we are and what we do, the company's been around since 2002. Uh, started off predominantly serving the oil and gas industry. However, we've branched out in the San Joaquin Valley and Southern California into mining and manufacturing, water and wastewater handling, agriculture, um, pretty much any type of industrial uh, and commercial engineering design and electrical construction. Uh, with that, uh, we've done projects all across the United States. We're licensed in multiple states. We've performed work overseas, and as of today, I'm setting up an office here in Midland, Texas, uh, to serve the Permian Basin. Uh, most important at IES is that we remain agile and responsive to client needs. Uh, I'm sure as many of you are aware, there's it, value needs to be added, whether it's with engineering, design, or project management, and we like to cater our services to just the value-added needs of a customer and not overwhelm them with too much. So I'll step through some of our capabilities here uh, pretty quick, and then we'll get to the meat of the presentation. Uh, we are a Rockwell-recognized control systems integrator. And then we do use ETAP and then a variety of 3D modeling software such as Aviva PDMS and SolidWorks, CADWorks. It's really down to the client and what their expectations are. We offer project management services from bare minimum on cost reporting to full-blown Microsoft project schedules that are resource loaded, cost loaded and provide uh, status on an even real-time daily basis uh, with our custom, customized SAP and Microsoft Project schedule integration. We can do some pretty neat uh, reporting and planning. Our process engineering team, they pick it up at the very beginning with an idea uh, from a client and we'll take it all the way through you know, front-end engineering, feasibility and constructability studies into process modeling uh, development of PFDs and PNIDs. Uh, we have several and uh, structural capabilities, as you can see here on the slide. A highlight that I want to point out, I'm not sure how many are familiar with laser scanning. This is really coming into its stride uh, across multiple industries. And in short, what it allows, uh, there's significant cost reductions in the design and construction, especially with brownfield installations. Now we can go out, scan a facility, and the model I'm going to show you is one that we scan the entire facility, uh, and it will give you an exact representation of what is in the field uh, before you ever start your design work. So whether it's you need to add pumps to an existing facility, or you just want to find out what the uh, tie-in points are and where the flanges are. And I'm not sure if anybody can see my mouse, but in the lower right-hand corner of this slide, you can see the contrast between where the original 3D model showed these pipe flanges to be 
and then where the laser scan picked it up, so the physical location in the field, and you could see how much of a difference there is. That's critical when we're going to do tie-ins. Mechanical engineering and design, uh, it's very much becoming a 3D world, which has increased our accuracy and has shown cost reductions to where we can pull accurate MTOs and figure out exactly how the contractor needs to install uh, whatever the mechanical equipment is or uh, piping. The complete physical installation can be modeled before it's ever brought to the field. Elect electrical engineering, we can provide engineering and design services from the interface with transmission, um, so 115 and higher, down to low voltage control systems. And in high demand here recently in the last couple of years has been electrical system studies, uh, arc flash analysis, and compliance type um, engineering to where we come out, we evaluate your electrical system, help you understand where you may or may not be in compliance, what you need to do uh, as far as arc flash requirements in your electrical safety program. That is uh, with OSHA and other uh, authorities becoming prevalent throughout. Uh, it hits everybody. No one's immune to it. So control systems engineering, um, again, anything from a complete facility, developing cause and effect charts, doing risk analysis, and designing a control system, whether it's relay-based or PLC, to uh, just installing a control valve and writing a simple control philosophy for how it should work. Our programming services, um, we most of the area we serve um, tends to be uh, Rockwell clients. However, we can program just about anything as far as a PLC or a SCADA application goes. Our electrical construction, uh, we do not perform overhead work at this time but we can do everything else. <laughs> so we'll, we'll build complete facilities. Now, some of the pictures here were from a steam generation facility. Uh, we can do new construction from the ground up to brownfield construction, uh, instrument installation and troubleshooting services, and fiber optic uh, networks. We have a UL panel fabrication facility. Uh, we both, we are Certified to do UL 508A and 698A for panels, just regular industrial control panels and panels in a hazardous location. And then IES has developed its own uh, steam generator control uh, system that we can install, and that's mostly used in heavy oil industry. So next up on our agenda, uh, we're going to discuss the project life cycle and collaboration. So let me have this pull up here. And okay, so the first phase of the project life cycle, and this is just any project and uh, should, probably not anything new, but what I want to do is step through it is how IES defines it and then how we operate um, on any given project. So the first step would be project planning. Uh, you know, Planning is the most critical aspect of any project. And so at first we identify a need and the expectations. I'll probably say that 20 more times in this presentation, but expectations are key. If you don't understand what the need is, what the expectations are, and how you are going to satisfy those expectations in the end, your project could be deemed a failure. And whether that's from the stakeholders or somebody in operations, you need to understand what the need is, what the expectations are, and how they'll be satisfied. So at the front end of the project, one of the deliverables may be a problem statement, a basic scope, or a basis of design. Then we move forward to preliminary engineering. Once we have that initial scope and the key stakeholders agree to it, we'll get into developing things such as block flow diagrams, begin the process modeling, continue with initial specification of equipment, long lead material, et cetera, and get us prepared for doing detailed engineering and design. What's another key point to make here is as we go through this project life cycle, it is imperative to have buy-off 
or approval from the stakeholders of who we're working with before moving to the next phase. Uh, with the project that I'm going to get to here, we held off, and this was very much a schedule driven project and cost was key, but we didn't move forward in the project until we had approval from say the automation group with what we were doing. And if that required more time, we would get approval before moving forward and then having the possibility of rework, which provides the cost savings in the end. Detailed engineering, this is where the fun begins. So in controls, you know, we may be developing a cause and effect chart and a control narrative. And then on the engineering and design side, you're looking at development of construction uh, ready drawings. The next phase is construction. Um, pretty self-explanatory. We're going to go out and build it based on the um, issued for construction packages or maybe it's just a control narrative with a description of how that valve should operate. But that's where all your pre-work prior to construction is going to uh, take place and really come to fruition. And then the commissioning phase. Ideally, this is where we're working the bugs out. Things went well in construction and we're just tuning it to get ready for startup. And startup, we're turning the process on, and um, hopefully there's no issues and everybody is happy. So the next slide here, uh, as we talk about collaboration, through each phase, what, we need everyone on board before moving to the next one. Uh, anytime you carry over uh, work that to the next phase and you don't have decisions made or things are still in question, you have a great risk of rolling back in the project, whether it's in time or incurring uh, costs for rework because you didn't get somebody to approve um, the type of pump you're using. So when everything's go, 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 we need to get this done and get it installed as quickly as possible, uh, that panic um, gets very expensive once you're into construction and you make a mistake. It's one thing to make that mistake on paper. It's another when you have crews mobilized and now they're waiting for you to figure out an engineering problem. So as we step through the, the planning phase, uh, the key there is that the early collaboration with the client, anybody that's on the project team, and we are defining specifications and requirements to set us up for preliminary engineering and detailed engineering and defining what those expectations are that are going to make the project a success. And then the next phase here with preliminary engineering, we're building on those requirements. Uh, with the project here that produced water, we had some very long lead equipment. And so as early as possible, and it was actually in the planning phase, we had identified the pumps, which were more than a year out and some of the electrical equipment that was approaching a year. So we needed to start the specifications early. Uh, so there is room to move things up in the life cycle, but uh, there is a little bit of risk if you move forward too fast. <clears throat> uh, on the sales side of things, working, and in this case we worked with CES, having them involved very early with the equipment specification paid dividends in the long run because the client was satisfied with what they were getting. They were able to ask the questions. And by the time we specified the equipment and it went on order, there were no more worries. We knew what we were getting. The detailed engineering phase, this is where the majority of the work is taking place. Um, here we are taking the expectations from the preliminary engineering and the planning phases, and we are working through all the details. Um, you should have, at this point, had everybody involved and agreed to um, and agree to what the design basis is going to be. And there's um, there's interaction between the client. Uh, however, you have a plan. You know what it's going to what that design is going to look like. We, there's often design reviews, and then constructability reviews. This is, you can bring construction in, in during the preliminary engineering phase and also the detailed engineering phase to help mitigate those RFIs and additional change orders 
uh, during the construction phase, and that's something that we push for at IES. And then we get into the construction phase. Uh, at IES, we'll blend our engineering and design team with construction to help uh, provide that on-site support during the construction phase as issues come up. And then commissioning, as I said before, um, working hand-in-hand -hand with the client, uh, sales team, technical reps to help work out bugs, say, in the VFDs or control loops, uh, commissioning that phase where all the testing takes place. And then startup, we are commissioning a plant with the process on. So now I'm going to move into the project life cycle uh, with respect to the produced water project. And let me, sorry, I'm pulling up my notes here. Okay. So the purpose of this project was the client was stuck with uh, water treatment facilities that were legacy and going to um, already operating at capacity. And so the schedule was set to where these pumps were going to increase capacity and allow them to move from one water treatment plant to a new one. Um, schedule was key because if they were not able to go to the new water treatment plant, they were looking at tens of thousands of dollars of day, a day uh, expenses for either operating the old plant uh, or having production shut in. So early on, it was important to get the pumps specified. So we talked about purchasing strategy for ways to uh, reduce costs, and we sole sourced some equipment based on what suppliers were able to provide and then also created construction, engineering, and other bid strategies to where the client was able to break up into manageable pieces and reduce costs and keep it competitive. All those things take place in the planning phase and are critical to, uh, if you're going to do those, you need to do them as early as possible in the project. <clears throat> Preliminary engineering, uh, you can see one of the transformers on the left. And I believe the, uh, I'll show some, the one line here in a minute. Uh, I believe there was a description that went out in the invite on this particular project. But we had some very long lead equipment on the mechanical side and the electrical side, uh, including a powerhouse that needed to be fabricated. And so at the very beginning of this project, bid strategies and getting the final equipment specifications in order uh, were critical to saving costs and meeting schedule. Next up, the detailed engineering phase. Um, here I'm going to switch to our 3D model, give you guys a picture to go with what it was that we did. Okay, so as you can see, let me zoom Hopefully that's not too much of a lag. Sometimes this I'm using Navisworks right now, and sometimes you can make people a little um, seasick uh, with the way you're able to orbit around the model. Okay. And then zoom out a little bit more. This facility, this is more the produced water handling side. Oops. And what we have here is the electrical building housing uh, the eight VFDs and switch gear. We had a cable tray system. I should probably start from the beginning here. Um, all of this was either laser scanned or modeled in. Um, it's hard to differentiate between the new and the existing, but this was an operating facility. And a critical aspect of this facility and the reason for the laser scanning was they couldn't shut down the facility. So all contractors, everything had to take place for construction with the facility operating. The shutdown was going to be a one day turnaround to tie in the new pumps. And that was one day at the most. 
So laser scanning and having a, an extremely accurate as built for what was out there was a requirement of this project just to make sure that we didn't have issues in saying that, well, that doesn't fit and it's because the as-built drawings were wrong. Uh, there was no room for error on this. So we have an electrical building that IES was the general contractor on um, and built this building. Then a cable tray system out to our 450 horsepower pumps. Um, you could see the dark blue piping header. Those were all new and they were increasing the capacity of the pumps um, closer to where my cursor is now. So this was uh, very tight quarters to operate in, <laughs> to say the least. Let me come back. Then as far as our power system goes, for those on the electrical side, uh, redundancy was built in. Uh, redundancy was key because the plant operates 24-7, 365 days out of the year. So it was dual 12 kV circuits, plenty of power monitoring, an ATS on the 12 kV side, and even an ATS on the 480 side. And the communication network, this particular client uh, uses Ethernet IP on DLR uh, with redundant control logics processors. And they've been on the forefront of getting this installed in multiple facilities, and they're really beginning to see the benefits of for their automation team especially and their IT team to see the integration of uh, using Ethernet IP. It's bridging the gap from previous protocols and mediums that were used uh, that may be specific to control systems that no one else is familiar with and now you have something that everybody's becoming familiar with. But their entire control system and network and then SCADA communications was over fiber and uh, DLR. And that was something that we designed um, for the client with their help. Okay. And the construction phase, uh, IES performed the electrical construction uh, and then with another mechanical contractor. However, this was a, uh, the goal from our client was to minimize RFIs and change orders from the construction side. So it was very important for IES to collaborate early on with the client, know what those expectations are, and make sure that our construction team was set up to be successful. And we did that by working hand in hand. Our engineers, our designers were working with our construction team to on <clears throat> both the mechanical and the electrical side. And IES very much took over this project. Uh, what started off as just an idea in the planning phase of, hey, we need to move X number of barrels of fluid to a new facility, uh, to managing the entire project, planning it, schedules, all based on I need to move X by this date and I need your help and I don't even know what I need help with yet. And so it was a great opportunity for our company to come in and work with the client on defining those expectations, planning to meet those expectations and sticking to that original plan. Uh, there were some deviations, but overall the project was successful. And a shining moment for IES was this was the largest project that we collaborated our engineering and construction teams with um, and including supplying uh, control panels and the communication panels out of our panel shop, but it also had all disciplines involved. And so we got to work some bugs out that we knew we had internally. However, we saw what the benefits were to planning our work, sticking to it, and then being there and being responsive for when construction did have questions in the field. The commissioning phase, um, thanks to CES and, and Rockwell for providing VFD support. Uh, these were rather large VFDs and we wanted to make sure that they were operating correctly. And so there was a lot of um, you know, collaboration between the sales and the technical teams to make sure in the end, you know, IES looks good, Rockwell looks good, CES looks good, and the client's satisfied. Um, so there was, there were bugs to work out during the commissioning phase. Uh, throughout 
the plant. However, uh, it was very successful during the startup phase, which has gone smooth enough to where the client has had the team move to other parts of the plant to uh, install new projects. They were, uh, in all, the client was very happy with our ability, the entire team, um, the team's ability to be able to operate in an existing location, not incur additional shutdowns, and um, be able to get the job done uh, on time. And there were some areas that went over budget, but not without um, a change in scope uh, or things that the client was aware of. We went back and forth on the number of pumps. Uh, that, that's kind of a big change. So uh, I'm going to stop there. I uh, hope that didn't rush much and uh, open it up for questions. Okay, I've unmuted everybody. Uh, I've got a couple of questions uh, that were sent. I'd like uh, anyone on the audio, is there any questions out there? Okay, it doesn't sound like we have any audio questions, so I'll go ahead and uh, send you these, Joe. The first one is, um, when it comes to communication network, uh, as there were NERC SIP security compliance considerations that are uh, a factor for many wastewater wastewater districts, um, to what extent was this accounted for in this particular application? Uh, there weren't any of those requirements. Uh, however, there were some similar security requirements based on this client's uh, area of work, and the it was very critical and I somewhat skimmed over it. That system architecture has been uh, <laughs> designed over the last two, three years uh, with for security. Uh, for And so that's something that is really fine-tuned now for this particular client. And I can't stress it enough that understanding what security requirements are in your network design and making sure those are decided upon at the very beginning of a project are key. And that's, uh, we took a lot of pride in working with the client on that. Um, and I know there are different requirements, um, whether it's through other regulatory agencies. Um, this that didn't have the requirements that you mentioned, but others that were probably just as, uh, just as critical. And we, we spent a lot of time in the development of that. And there's not much detail that I can give about it, uh, but there was ample time spent on that network design. Okay. okay. Uh, the next one I have here is, uh, this project reflects a considerable investment made by the end user. While the project went well, can you comment on the increased capacity improvements or return on investment that was expected and what was achieved? Okay. Uh, good question. The the financial number, uh, there were a couple of things there. The main one um, was not being, not shutting production in at tens of thousands of dollars a day. Uh, so that was not an option for uh, this project team. This had to come online and we were able to uh, do that successfully without them having to shut in production. So a lot of it was making sure that the bad news didn't come down, um, and so they were able to commission this, have water flowing to get them out of the other plants. The capacity uh, was increased by about 300,000 barrels uh, of fluid per day, uh, which let's, I think it was about two and a half times it increased from the existing capacity, which sets them up for their expected production numbers over the next couple of years. So this was an extremely critical project for this company for the next five years. And um, the other number, I don't have the number off the top of my head, uh, but there was a significant decrease in the number of RFIs and change orders from not only our company once we performed the electrical construction, but from the mechanical partner that we used on this project. And the client was very satisfied with comparing to historical data that they have from even our company and others by the time it gets to construction. 
that RFIs and change orders dropped dramatically, and that was because of the collaboration and the planning that was done with all disciplines from the beginning of the project. And I didn't mention it, but we used things such as the onboarding process and the constructability reviews to bring the contractors in early in the design so that we could get their feedback and it wasn't something that they decided to offer to the client after they were awarded the bid. Okay, great. Um, and then third question here is, can you share what some of the top best practices and lessons learned that uh, IES took away from this project? Uh, yes, uh, we were able to build um, quite a few tools or modify existing tools that we had for project management, uh, but I cannot stress it enough that the <clears throat> one tool is developing an interview process to where you have a script of questions that you can provide to an engineer or a project manager, somebody that needs to scope out a project where I say, I want to increase my capacity to move fluid by 30%. And if they don't even know where to begin, we developed a guideline to give to them to say, okay, well, first you need to talk to your electrical engineering department and find out what, you know, where the site is and what electrical capacity you have. So we developed a, a guide that can be given to anybody uh, to walk them through all disciplines and all aspects of a project to ask those questions that you don't want to ask four months into a you know, a $20 million project to say, oh, did we want RTDs on the motor bearings? No, that's something that you do when you're specifying the, the pump and motor. Uh, but sometimes you're working with a team that may not be as experienced. And so one of the learnings was let's develop a tool that we could give to anybody to guide them through any project. Uh, and then the other is just the planning. We did a lot of planning and back and forth and daily and weekly collaboration to where, where we were not fixated on what the Microsoft project schedule told us. We would use that schedule as a starting point and then we would plan to it to make sure that structural, before they can do their seismic study or the stress analysis, they need to have the foundation locations done and know where the pumps are going to be set. And so we find out from the mechanical team, hey, when are you all going to be ready? and plan those activities from the drafter all the way through to the project manager or to the client so that all the dots are connected and you know what your critical path is going to be and what will affect that critical path. And so the other learning was just that the planning and the close collaboration really made this project successful. Okay, very good. Um, if there are no more questions, I'd like to go ahead and thank Joe and the IES team for presenting and for all of you for attending. If anyone in your organization wanted to attend but was not able, a recording of this webinar will be made available later this week. If you would like to have additional discussions on this or related topics, please feel free to reach out to the IES team or reach out to your local CED, Royal Wholesale, or CES sales representatives, and we will discuss further. If there are no more questions, we'll close out this session. Thank you all for attending. Thanks, everyone.